Hi, everyone, and welcome to ANLI 540, the introduction of human language. I'm the instructor for the videos for this course, and my name is Dr. M. Buchanan. So what is this course about? What are you going to learn this semester? Well, the first thing we're really going to cover is computational linguistics. And I'm going to use this term to broadly describe many forms of text analytics, statistics, and natural language processing that occurs on human language. So the course is called human language modeling, right? And so we're going to cover a lot of different types of ways to model human language. Okay. And really, that means that we're going to learn a lot about dealing with language. It's a very messy construct. It's often unstructured data. And so we'll look at how we can convert that into something quantitative that can be analyzed. And we're going to do this by learning both R and Python. So you'll use both languages throughout the semester. And often it'll be the same task or the same analysis. It's just done in both languages so that you can use whichever one you feel like you excel at. And this is partially so that it expands your skill set, but also because the job market heavily favors both of these. You will make reports of your own work in Markdown. And so you'll have code and <clears throat> and analyses and interpretations in the same documents so you can learn how to make pretty reports. This will also allow me to make sure that you're interpreting what you're doing correctly. So what are we going to learn? Well, we'll learn a little bit about what is computational linguistics and what is language processing and how can we analyze that data. We'll think about how we can apply statistics to answer questions about qualitative data, because language is, in theory, qualitative data. It's not quantitative by nature. We can make it quantitative, but it starts qualitative. And then what are popular ways to think about association? And what are popular ways to model data? So one of the most popular things that I hear from analytics folks is about topics modeling. So we'll cover that towards the end of the semester. So in this part of the normal class, when you're in class, I would go over the syllabus. So if you're taking this course from me or someone else, you should read the syllabus and look at it for all the course policies. In a regular class is when I would spend time going over it, right? We will use Canvas for all course related materials. So if you're just here for fun, you can ignore this part. And we would go and check those things out. Now to get into the just kind of like descriptions and thinking about the sort of intro or overview, with human language, there's a lot to consider. So first, let's think about what's the last thing that you said to someone? Okay, now said is, is used in a lot of ways here. It could be talking like I'm doing now. It could be signing if I'm a deaf speaker. Um, I could be typing or texting. So there are lots of communication channels. Body language also matters. Okay, what's the last thing that you wrote down? So there's a clear distinction between the spoken symbol system of language and the written symbol system of language, right? And then also the visual symbol system of language, um, if I think about ASL. It's the last thing that you heard okay, or read. And like, how exactly do we do these things? So a, a little bit of what I'm gonna do in this lecture is not only talk about like, what is language, but also a little bit about kind of the background biologically, cognitively, socially of language. So we're just gonna kind of touch on a lot of different um, psycholinguistic areas and biological areas to just kind of give us a feel for the kind of breadth and depth of the topic that we're dealing with. So a quick history, very brief, very quick history of studying language, right? So before um, <clears throat> studying language, mostly from the perspective of psychologists, uh, obviously linguists have been around studying language for a long time, but the kinds of work that we're doing is thinking about language in the individual. So we're gonna kind of focus from that perspective. And so before and around 1900, we've got Galton, who's thinking a lot about IQ, and Freud, obviously, who thought language um, represented some dysfunction that was going on with humans. Um, and Freud had a lot of like dream analysis, that kind of stuff. But this really took off cognitively thinking about thinking, right, in the 1950s. So there were famous conferences at Cornell and Dartmouth that really allowed us to think about computational language, <clears throat> meaning 
we're not just studying syntax and like documenting languages, which traditional linguistics, we're now able to compute things with language. And so there was a, a push towards thinking about the brain like a computer, which really allows us to translate thinking about language as a statistical symbol system, which we can then apply statistics to, or program computers to act like. Okay. And so the, the, <laughs> in the 1960s, moving forward, there was a large debate between Noam Chomsky, who's kind of considered the father of modern psycholinguistics, and B.F. Skinner, who was a, a um, behaviorist in psychology. And their big fight was sort of the nature versus nurture component when it comes to language. So Chomsky thought, still does, he's still around, uh, language is innate, it's built in, right? It's pre-programmed into us. Um, whereas Skinner thought it was all environmental. Spoiler alert, it's both. So there is a, several innate components to language, several biological components, but there's also plenty of interaction with our environment. And so we can't ignore either side, but we'll mostly focus on the environmental influences. And the field of, I'm using computational linguistics again, remember as like this sort of large term that covers a lot of fields at once, um, because we're doing something a little more than traditional natural language processing. And um, so I like to think about it as computing language, right? Modeling language. And that's heavily influenced by um, research in artificial intelligence, which is also kind of a crossroads field between cognitive psych and um, computer science, the imputation or computing power that has uh, improved over the years really has allowed us to do a lot more of this work and better and faster. And just really thinking about computers and, and language, right? So I, can I program a computer to, to do language like I do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> sort of, not really. Um, this is a long history of the Turing test, right? But if I now have computers that, like sitting on my desk and I'm talking to you on that are uh, much more powerful than the like 1960s, I can certainly do a lot more than they could back then. So the, the research in this area and the use of this work has really propelled forward given uh, the increases in computation. Let's back up a step and say, what is language even? You would think this would be an easy thing to define, but it's actually not. It's a set of, of symbols and rules that allow us to communicate. Symbols could be printed, like what you're looking at on the screen here. Symbols could be spoken aloud. They could be sound-based. Symbols can be body-based. So I'm thinking of ASL. They could also be um, body um body language, so we have a way of standing and giving off vibes, if you will, um, that project communication, right? Now the rules, that's all the syntax stuff. So that's the order um, that we put them in or the way we conjugate the words. And there's several other rules that translate the symbols into meaning. So the language itself are the symbols and the rules and the application is how we go from that to meaning, to understanding. <clears throat> And we're specifically focusing here on natural language, meaning language from humans. So we're not studying animal language and we're not studying computer language, language from humans. Okay. And it's kind of interesting to study computer languages because they're developed by people and you see a lot of these features in there, but they don't really talk back. Okay, they do when you're trying to work, right? But not, they're not creative like we are. And so that brings me to what a very famous set of rules, if you will, which is called Hockett's feature design. Okay. So the relationship between languages is also really interesting, but what makes language human, right? And it's different from separate other communication systems like computer language or Morse code or something like that, right? And there's like 12 to 20 of these, but I wanna talk about four or five of them in particular. The first one being that it's semantic. Okay, we'll talk about semantics a lot this semester. And that's where each symbol is somehow tied to meaning. Okay, so the symbols, again, they can be sound, they can be written, they can be uh, visual, are tied to some sort of meaning. So stop sign is a visual symbol. Okay. But those symbols are arbitrary. 
Okay. So this is a rose by any other name idea is that the, the fork does not necessarily have to be called fork to still represent that. So we can have um, an arbitrary relationship between the symbols and their meaning. <clears throat> the symbols are discrete, meaning they can be broken down, recombined and used again later. And we do this a lot through more, what are called morphemes. Morphemes are the individual units of meaning in a word. So something like run and running are similar words, but run has one morpheme, running has two, where it's run, the action, and the ing, meaning the tense or the time period that that's happening. Okay. So you kind of think of morpheme if, as um, the original root word and its affixes. And then productivity. <clears throat> Productivity really should have been called creativity. This is one of the biggest distinguishers between artificially intelligent systems that it can't capture and animal language and us. Um, user, users are creative of language. Okay? And most other systems tend to fail this rule. Okay? It's very hard to design creative systems. Now, um, some parts to peep to the language itself, right? So we've got this biological component to language, right? That people study where um, we could be applying statistics to uh, fMRI data or um, um, brain fire, EEG data, right? So you'd have to understand those biological components. So there's specific areas of the brain that control language. The big two here are, are um, Broca's, here in the front, and Wernicke's here in the back. Broca's controls um, speech planning. Uh, what do I want to say in response to something you heard? Wernicke's controls what am I hearing? What am I understanding? It's like translating sounds to the symbols, to your internal dialogue. Obviously, we still have also have to have this mouth tongue larynx system that is very different from other animals that allows us to do speech the way we do. Okay. There's also a huge section of the brain called the motor cortex right here that helps control speech utterance and like sort of the musculature planning to, to speak. Okay. And so there are a bunch of biological areas that's also genes or proteins with genes that are, that are related to language. And that big one's called FOXP2. And if that protein and gene thing is messed up, um, you tend to see severe um, language difficulties. It's also tied to Williams and or Down syndrome. So there's clearly some biological component to it. Chomsky's right. There is partially an innate component to this. It's also very cognitive. And I feel like one thing that people miss as data analysts is they spend so much time focusing on making the pretty pictures and running the models. They don't think about the fact that this involves some sort of cognitive system. <laughs> right, the people, the thinking behind it. And so um, our, our cognitions are, are what control the symbol system, right? We think a lot about word order. This is a part of the syntax. And so there's some sort of, of um, component that we can kind of separate from biological, right? I know the, the brain is causing the thinking, but these uh, cognitive components are really interesting to help define. It's also very social. Okay. meaning that there's um, sometimes what's called pragmatics, the knowledge of the other users. So when I'm writing an email to my boss, I do that very differently than writing an email um, to a friend. Okay, so there are a lot of social rules, a lot of attitudes. The text that you find on Twitter is definitely not the same text you find on Twitch or Reddit, right? So the, 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 the environment matters. So what's the purpose of language? Well, if you ask me on this, the first thing that always comes up is communication. Okay, that's an obvious one. But you're also missing this emotional expression. So often language is used to convey and express those emotions. Social interaction, which can be loosely lumped into communication, but it kind of requires its own category um, because communication can be simply typing on a blog that no one reads. <laughs> so there also is a social component that's sort of back and forth. Okay. And then one that people tend to forget is the thinking. So most of us have an internal monologue or an internal voice, and we use language to think, right? So when I'm solving my computational problems on a long run, I am using language still. 
So that's why it's sometimes very hard to separate language and the individual, but it's also very hard to separate language and culture because they're also heavily tied together. <clears throat> so how might we study some of this? Well, if you are in traditional linguistics, you would be studying language. Okay? And this tends to be more, um, linguistics has sort of molded and changed over the years. It sometimes goes with anthropology, sometimes it goes with psychology. It's kind of a field of its own um, that can think about morphology, phonology, and we'll describe these later. Um, but it's, it's the study of language. Okay, so that's why I like calling all of this work computational linguistics, because we are computing with language. Okay. But we could get more in the weeds where there are some folks who are psycholinguistics, which is technically I think where I fall, where we think about the psychological processes involved in language. Okay, sometimes this is called cognitive linguistics. And often these folks are proposing um, pr ways that we think things happen. Like, how do you read, right? Like, how does that process actually happen? And so there are lots of cool models, one called the easy reader that proposes how that is happening. Okay. And we will look at a lot of psychological research, partially because of my background, but also because I think it helps um, when you're running these analyses to kind of get a feel for what are some, some ways that people who do like theory research think about this stuff, okay. which then can be applied to more um, business type research. <clears throat> okay. That's why I really, I love the phrase computational linguistics because it's thinking about linguists and we can think about cognitive science through the lens of computer science. All right. And so there are even more names for this. Some people call it text analytics. Some people call it opinion mining, sentiment analysis. Mm -hmm. There's so many, um, which really is a, is a product of the fact that it's crossed over into so many different fields. Okay. So nothing really different here. I will say there is more of a traditional NLP, right? So traditional lateral language processing where you're doing part of speech tagging and dependency parsing. So we're, that's the other class. In this class, we're gonna mostly focus on um, sort of analyses that you may not have seen before and concepts in language that you may not have thought about before. And what all of those things focus on is meaning, semantics, the use of language, cognitive processing, or there's this relationship between language and reality. So this is where it really gets into the idea of polysemy where there are words that have multiple meanings, and how do you know which one is the one people are interested in? Okay. And um, also the shift of words over time. So what we see is the definition one period of time is not the reality in another period of time. Okay. And so, oh, I have all of these described. Um, but meaning, understanding semantics, how do people interpret meaning, what synonyms could be used, how are words related to each other? This can be really helpful in trying to create summary scores or um, text summarization or um, thinking about political bias or hate speech, right? A lot of these fall into the sort of meaning category. Uh, the use of language, how does that language change based on speaker, scenario, what part of the sentence we're in. And so if you're ever typing into Google, for instance, it's trying to predict what word you wanna type next. Cognition, what are the cognitive functions that allow us to make, interpret, and receive language? Okay, this is a little more theoretical base, but it has its applications for business purposes. And then language and reality is the relationship between word and their perceptions. So a lot of this research is on slang, which honestly, the instant you start studying some slang words, they've already changed. So it's a really uh, fast moving field. <clears throat> Now there's a whole separate group of folks <laughs> who do language acquisition. Okay, this is when you are developing your kid and you are acquiring language. And there's even more people who study language learning. So as we get older, um, learning a second or third language. Uh, so I don't tend to cover developmental work because that is way more heavily cognitive and theory based where we're doing co computational work. But I do want you to know there are other fields that are interested in studying how language works. Okay. And some ideas behind like looking into that literature 
might be that if you are if you can figure out how people learn or acquire language that might give us some understanding or some rules on how to program computers to do the same thing. Many deep learning models have, have thought about this line of work right so mathematically they just they work they're cool but they're based heavily on the idea of cognitive arch architecture like how the brain actually works so it's important to understand the biological and the cognitive components because they're baked into these models that people are using. And then this is also where Skinner versus Chomsky come in. So is it acquired? Is it innate? Is it, you know, like how does, how does that work? And I would say that nature versus nurture people are never gonna agree, but it is likely a strong combination of each. So within this area, what could I study? Well, I could study phonetics and phonology. Okay, this is the sounds and language, accent, tone, emphasis. That's what's gonna be really important for text-to-speech processing, either way. So speaking out loud. So if you've ever had something read, read to you, it's just quite funny to listen to because the emphasis isn't quite the same as human speakers. Um, or if you're like speaking and it's translating your text. So live captioning is really fascinating right now and how far that has come. Okay. And that's based on a phonemic analysis, which is the smallest unit of sound. Phonemes vary by language. So there are phonemes in for, for Spanish or Chinese that I cannot say growing up as an English speaker. So it's also um, based on the language you're working with. Syllables, however, are where the emphasis occurs. So phonemes are the sounds, but syllables are where the accent is. We could study syntax, which is really important for uh, chatbot systems that speak back to you or for things like search algorithms, right? Because you are typing words in a order that is correct, right? Is understandable. So what is the combination of words that allow us to produce meaning? Okay. In most languages, word order is one of the most important rules for syntax. Okay. And about 75% of languages are subject, verb, object, like English, or subject, object, verb, like some European languages. And that tells you a lot about who's doing what to whom. So syntax matters a lot for a lot of different reasons but also text summarization, because you got to write the system back out that understands who's doing what to whom. You could study semantics, meanings, metaphors, analogies. A lot of our work this semester will be in semantics because it's not only what I do, but it's also what most people are interested in, um, in analyzing what's happening in a text. Right. Now, lexical versus compositional, compus, compus compositional um, semantics. Lexical semantics is more on the like lower level. What are the morphemes? What are the syntax? Understanding, you know, translation of syntax to meaning. Compositional is more about how are those words and phrases and sentences producing this larger understanding of a text, okay? So this is more about comprehension. I could also study morphology, which is the units of meaning, the words in a sentence. Um, I think this stuff is kind of interesting because it allows us to think about um, tense change, subject verb agreement. So morphology in tandem with syntax, really important with chatbots. Okay. Because if you want to make a realistic one, it needs to speak the way the users speak. We can move up into the lexicon, which is the mental dictionary of language. So what are the sub, what are the search engine keywords that you should use, right? So doing some SEO. And that might be that you figure out what the hot words are in the current mental lexicon. We could think about pragmatics. So what is the best way to deliver your message to your audience? So if you're in politics, this is really important, right? Know thy audience. <laughs> and so pragmatics is a study of the, the use in different scenarios. And then the last thing we'll actually cover this semester is discourse processing. So discourse is when we study like entire paragraphs and start corpora, huge bodies of text for summarization or categorization purposes. Okay. And then a section we won't really cover, but I think is kind of neat is the stylistics. 
So we can study language style, like writing style, and determine who wrote something. And this is kind of the, the research like on Shakespeare, like who actually wrote Shakespeare? There's some proposal that um, other folks wrote it. It's not one person. And so analyzing the writing style and seeing if it's uh, consistent or inconsistent. And so now I just want to give you some examples of things that we might cover, a very simple analysis and example, and some just kind of basic terminology to get us started. Okay. So what are words? Okay, a lot of our research is on the individual words themselves and then how we can combine them into meaning, but you know, learn nouns, adjectives, adverbs, and verbs. Okay. These are the big four. They are the words that produce the meaning in a sentence. And the meaning in the sentence is usually the thing we're interested in. Okay. There are other types of words like determinants, the NA, pronouns, you, me, he, she, okay. prepositions of, into, on, okay. conjunctions, and, but, or, and then there's even more of them. But those are the ones that hold, they're the glue of the sentence. So the first four are the meaning, the last four are the glue. Sometimes these are called stop words and we'll actually ignore them but there's entire books called The Secret Life of Pronouns for a reason, where there are, are interesting things that can happen with these words. And so there tends to be kind of two feelings about it. Study the meaning making words or study the function words. Both are important, obviously, if you're gonna be doing syntax. So once we start building words up, we put them into phrases. Phrases are a good way to study um, certain uh, phenomenon because phrases are kind of the level that we are reading at. So we tend to read in like chunks. Okay. So a noun phrase is a group of words where the noun is the focus. So this would be the actor in a sentence. So I have for my other class, the angry bear chased the frightened little squirrel. Okay. A noun phrase here, the angry bear. Um, another noun phrase, little squirrel. Okay. And what that tells us is who the actors are or who the things are being acted upon. So we're trying to do some, some dependency relationships, understanding the relationships between objects in a text. You got to know where the nouns are. We could also have verb phrases where the focus is the verb. So chased here is our verb. It's the action of a sentence, so the doing part. So we could analyze verbs just to see what is happening in a text. Or we can think about prepositions. These are often the modifiers. So adjectives and adverbs um, are often paired with prepositions. So this is the description of the text. So we have the actors, the actions, and the description in the text. Simply by knowing a little bit about phrases, I can start to do both syntax and semantic analysis. Now this allows us to make tree diagrams and do more of this in the 520 class. But the nice thing about tree diagrams is they often also give you a level of complexity. So sentences that have larger trees are more complex. Sentences that have deeper trees, meaning they go further down in their leaves and branches, are also more complex. So if you're trying to make things simple for your users to read, you could consider decomplexifying this, so to speak, so making it simpler. Now, a network model, especially in semantics, allows us to make pictorial depictions of relationships between words. And um, you can check out, to me, was one of the coolest projects around called the Small World of Words. You can also participate in this study if you're interested. So if you go to their homepage, you can participate in your native language or your second language if you'd like. When we're exploring the lexicon, we can start to think about, so the lexicon, again, this is the dictionary, we can start to think about how words are related to each other by building sort of a social network analysis of words. So we're gonna pick my favorite word, which is cheese. And what we can do is start to get a picture of what cheese is. Now, I'm not sure I can make this tech. I can't make the bubbles bigger, apologies. But what we've got here is sort of the a one that was kind of one hop network. So all these words are directly related to cheese in the network using um, small world of words. If we used another project like WordNet, it might be slightly different. And what they did in this study was they just asked people, what's the first word you think of when it comes when it, when someone says cheese? Okay, what about the second and the third? And then they tabulated them all up. 
So the most prominent relationship is food here. It's the largest bubble. And they've kind of colored these networks based kind of how on their interrelations. So we've got a kind of this kind of food block. We've got this kind of mouse and a still a little bit of food block. We've got how cheese is made over here and um, color. Okay. And smile from, from taking pictures. Okay. My class recently, someone asked me to show the music. And it has a less complex network, whole bunch of instruments and sounds, but then we've got a little bit of emotion here and then songs and tunes, <coughs> excuse me. And so these semantic networks allow us to start thinking about like, well, if I want to promote my new music business, what are the kinds of things that people might be searching? Okay. Here are a bunch of related words, real easy for you. Now, um, <clears throat> semantic networking kinds of models are, are, are um, um, vector space models is what we're gonna do for the semester. Uh, focus on meaning rather than grammar. Okay. And there's kind of two ways that we can think about meaning and their relationships. Okay. And I don't think, uh, usually I actually meant to take this off the slides, but since we're here, <coughs> Um, we can start to build these networks based on either propositional logic. So, you know, a cat is an animal. That's a true or false kind of statement. So we'll actually talk about um, studies that use this idea later this semester. So if I said a dog is a tree, you should say no. And in a semantic network, they wouldn't be connected. Or we can think about other types of logic. Okay? Um, how might I represent knowledge? So the relationship between objects. So a cat um, is not a dog, right? But it's related to dog because they are both tied to being an animal, both house pets, that kind of stuff. Um, and sometimes building these systems are called ontologies. So what is the function of the object? Where might we find the object? What kinds of features does it have? Okay. And we'll talk about both types of studies um, often on this semester. So we're gonna look at very traditional um, classic models of categorization because I think they help you understand how you might start to build that for your own internal um, business systems. Now, another um, really key component to a lot of this research is corpora. Corpora is, corpora is the plural for corpus. A corpus is a large body of text. Okay, large may depend on what type of text we're talking about, but generally a lot of words. Okay, and what can you do with that? Well, a whole bunch of stuff. Okay. Most commonly, corpora are used for part of speech tagging, stimming, limitization, grammar testing, and thinking about the roles and types of words. I use corpora a lot in my own research to do a lot of things. Okay. Now, part of speech tagging is where we simply tag things as noun, adjective, ever. Stimming and limitization are ways to think about the root word or the lemma for, for a word. And there are two different approaches to reducing the, the number of possible words and complexity in a, in a document. Okay. Um, other things we can do is build these network and vector space models, but we can also do semantic analysis on these, thinking about topics and themes. So popular corpora, corpora. The brown corpus, which is easily one of the most overused corpus. Um, it's a great teaching corpus, but it was first published in a book it's really popular because it has text in like fiction, news, um, and a couple of other things, academic. So it allows you to think about what are the differences in text based on their target audience. Okay. The lob corpus was the answer to the brown, British English version of the brown corpus. The child's corpus has children's speech, which is clearly different than adult speech. WordNet we will cover um, is a hierarchically structured database. So it is mostly nouns, adjectives, adverbs, and verbs, and the meaning making words, but it has a really nice system of how everything is related to each other using an ontology like we talked about in the last slide. So cat is an animal, is connected to animal. Tree bank, there are many tree banks. Tree banks are really great. They're used for, um, limitization and part of speech tagging. So it's thinking about what are the root words. They're kind of like little mini dictionaries of languages. 
Reuters is a very famous news corpus. It's often used for machine learning tasks. The American and British National Corpus, COCA, which is the contemporary corpus of contemporary American English, and then the um, English Corpora website that has like um, iWeb Corpus and the Times Corpus, and then Google. So these are corpora just like huge bodies of text in all sorts of forms and um, use cases. But then to me, the newest and more, most interesting thing that we can look at are, are web corpora. So these are based off of Reddit or Amazon or Twitter or Yelp or IMDb. And um, there's a fairly famous Usenet corpus for, for early discussion boards. And they're often hosted on Kaggle. And to me, they really highlight the differences between formal written text that you might find on like a news website and the use and way we talk to each other <clears throat> that's more informal. Okay, so we can study both types of things. So what's the actual use of language versus what's the more formal written language. So we're gonna apply statistics to language. And I wanna show you, I kind of wanna give you a small proof of concept about why and how that's possible. So originally people thought about linguistics and studying language as qualitative, right? You had to have these qualitative skills, a lot of hand work, okay? And any statistics that were presented were often simple percentages or means, okay? And so if I argue with you that language is innate, that implies that all people have the same underlying system, okay? We have this innate built-in biologically programmed system, okay? So we just kind of figure out what that system is. Okay. This is the underpinning for a lot of AI, is this idea that there's this programmable system. Okay. And so that innate question actually ignores completely the, I, the, the body of research on the fact that we are what are called intuitive statisticians. Okay. You cannot ignore the, the properties of statistical um, inference that we use in our environment. So children, if you've ever listened to children speak, they're like learning the rules. So they learn pretty quickly the rules of past tense. So they say, you know, I, I um, run it and I goed, even though we would normally say I ran and I went because we know that there are exceptions to those statistical rules. But as you're learning, you learn uh, I add an S to anything that's more than one, and I add an ED for past tense, and I add an ING for present tense. And so um, those rules have probabilities. So we are intuitively learning these, these facets of language by understanding their probabilities. And we also understand the probability of word meanings. So when someone says bank, more than likely you're gonna think about financial institution because it's the most probable or the most likely interpretation. So we are understanding these intuitive statistics about language as we are processing. So, and language is pros, um, shaped by our use. So I say homo scedasticity more times in a week than most people because I'm a statistics teacher, right? So if we're using statistics to process and understand it, clearly we can analyze language with statistics. Okay. So what most statistics, most language systems do is grab both of that innate component. So deep learning uses this idea of neural networks that we have in our brain, right? And this statistical properties component and combine them together. So clearly we can use multiple components, both the innate and then the nature and the nurture to help us uh, analyze language. And if we're building language systems, like let's say you're trying to build um, an artificially intelligent chatbot, for example, you're using both of those things as well. So what matters most? Frequency. I always tell students, if you don't know the answer, the answer is frequency. And I'll get a good laugh if you're really wrong, but I'll probably give you partial credit because frequency predicts many of our, of our guesses for language, our phenomenon that are happening cognitive wise, like frequency answers almost everything. <laughs> it's very important variable. Okay. I just had my like big conference and I remember asking one of the presenters, like 
I don't see frequency in your model. What's going on? And like everyone laughed <laughs> and they told me, oh, we controlled for it. So frequency is very important. Um, the cognitive mechanisms. So there are limits on our computational systems, right? Imposed by our biology um, and the, how much caffeine one has had for the day. Okay. But within that, we store, like in our heads, right up here, we have stored these probabilistic structures. And I have of categories here because we're going to talk specifically about category learning. But that probabilistic structure of language is remember it, it's stored, it's up here in your brain, okay? And so when you um, are trying to interpret something and understand semantics, you are intuitively using those probabilities, okay? So like I said, if you, if you say bank, mostly you think about financial institutions because um, you know that's the most probable, even if you didn't think about the fact that you knew it was the most probable. Okay? And the research on category learning has really helped us understand this. Okay. And so we'll talk a lot about categories because they tell us a lot of interesting things about language that you can then apply in other scenarios. Okay. There are also some social mechanisms, and this is our understanding of how words are represented. So there's the real meaning of a word, and then there's its dictionary definition, right? So this whole idea of urban dictionary, um, where real meanings and use of meanings are different things. And that is heavily influenced by our surroundings. Okay. And I also want to um, make note that our cognitive mechanisms are also influenced by surroundings, right? So if I talk about football, which to me means American football, <laughs> and to a European, they're going to think I'm talking about soccer. So even something simple like that is influenced by what I'm doing day to day. And for social mechanisms, I really want you to stop and think about all the new words you've learned in your lifetime. One of my favorites is hangry. <laughs> it is easily one of the best new word merges. But this happens all the time, right? Um, I would say that just even the idea of machine learning is a phrase that has really picked up in our lifetimes. And then slang. Slang is really fun. So we'll talk a little bit about slang, but if you think about some of the hardest things that um, people are trying to solve language-wise right now, slang is one of the biggest ones. Hate speech is very difficult to process and understand because it heavily involves um, either context. So, you know, trying to decide if this is sarcasm or if this is parody or if this is hate speech is really difficult. Because okay, to a computer, all those words look the same. So now things we can do is we can model word choice. And this is some stuff we'll do. So what word should come next in the sentence? Okay. We can work with corpora. So we'll work with uh, some small corpora, just so our computers don't blow up. Okay. We can think about making a behavioral profile. So it's almost, <laughs> it sounds kind of like FBI-ish, but weak words have profiles of ways that they act in different scenarios. We can build ourselves some semantic vector models. This is topic modeling, network analysis. And then in theory, things like word to vec fast text, and deep learning are all complicated neural net models based on this concept of vector models. Okay. And then I could go straight simple and think about how uh, take some behavioral data or some um, market research and run a regular old ANOVA. So this guy is kind of the limit here. Uh, so not, not to play out that there, but it's language, you have to use something special. We're actually going to talk about linear regression, because let's say that you have a website and you, you know, one week you've got a, um, a, one phrase on there. And then next week you have a different phrase and you're trying to see which one got you more clicks, right? That ends up being a t-test, <laughs> which clicks were more. Um, so we're still analyzing language, which, which option is best but we can use regular old boring statistics like t-tests. So to end on kind of um, a, um, an example of a language specific analysis, that's a famous one. So Berlin and Kay sort of propose this idea about color. So the way that we linguistically use color, their argument is, <laughs> excuse me, that it follows this pattern that you see here on the screen, that color vocabulary kind of varies by either the type of text or the, the, the history of the language or the um, evolution of the language. 
And so we would expect to see um, differences between white and black and things like brown. So um, these are just used in different frequencies. Okay. Now, if color theory holds, what we should find is that the frequency of black should be more universal across different types of text because it's an early color stage. And the use of more complex sort of explanatory colors, right? These are more adjective um, descriptors, more flavorful, if you will, um, should be biased towards certain types of text because it should come later. So this is like a development of a literature or um, a language. Right? So these should be more equally represented uh, and these should be less equally represented. And then green and blue, green and yellow should be somewhere in the middle. So the data here is available in the package for the using linguistics of our book. And it's from the Corpus of Contemporary American English or COCA. And it's just simply a count of the adjective use of color terms. So this is really why understanding that an adjective is important <laughs> is key. And one issue that we have across all of these analyses is that corpora are not all made equal, they're different sizes. So I can't just do like a regular old analysis on this. I gotta think about how do I deal with the fact that these just have different base rates. So here's a picture of the, of the data. Um, we've got spoken fiction, academic and press, and then we just have word frequency. Um, so the total numbers of black for spoken given the sample size for spoken. All right. So what I'm going to do is take the number of words in each of these categories by looking at COCA's statistics that they have. Um, so I pulled this from the textbook. And so this is the, the size for each one. I'm going to calculate what's called a deviation of proportions. So what we've got are the raw counts. We'll convert those into proportions. And then we'll just see if those proportions deviate from each other. This is very similar to a chi-square analysis, which we'll cover later this semester, but it's kind of a special version of it because they're proportions and not raw counts. Okay. And so you don't have to understand this equation at all, but it's what you're essentially doing is calculating um, the observed count of a number minus sort of an expected count value that you might expect given the proportion, right? And um, calculating a statistic that represents how much variance there is in those proportions. So variance is close to zero indicate that there's like, they're pretty evenly spread, right? The use of that uh, word is evenly distributed across the different options, okay? Values close to one, because this is, this is bounded. Standard deviation is not bounded. It's based on the scale. This ranges from zero to one, okay? Um, indicates that one of the subsets is more strongly favored. It's not balanced across these different um, types of language. Okay. And if we look at black, which is an early color term, and then look at gray, which is a later color term, what do we see? Now, the theory would say that black should be evenly distributed across text because it's an early color term. Okay. And it pretty much is. It's very close to zero. Now, gray should be biased towards one or another of the different types of, of text because it's a later color term. So some things are more diverse than others in their color term usage, and that is what we see. So black is more evenly represented, gray is more distributed across the text. And we'll look at this idea again later and, and think about how to analyze this data in a different way. So just a kind of a simplistic example of, of how I might start to think about um, analyzing language. So in summary, what are we going to learn? Well, you're going to learn in Python, R and Python, and how to mix and match. You're going to learn how to deal with categorical data, frequency counts, clustering these things. Um, how do I deal with um, uh, sort of yes-no variables? Then we're going to talk about how to deal with continuous data, so factor analysis, linear regression, um, vector space models. Okay. And we're going to look at higher order modeling techniques. And that's the order we're going to work in. So we're going to go from continuous to categorical to full model, like big distributional models. Okay. 
And so we'll talk about traditional light and semantic analysis, topics modeling, word to vec information theory and network modeling and social network analysis, and a very brief foray into deep learning. Okay. So we're gonna start simple and get more complex. And each section will give you some sort of traditional cognitive research and some background. So you can think about how um, language is structured to kind of give you a little bit of, of um, background is the only word I could think of to help you understand some of the analyses we're doing. And I find one thing that I, I sort of dislike about the current field of analytics that is processing text is they process all this text and then they pr present this output, but they don't really understand conceptually how that should have occurred or how it could have happened or even what the results mean okay? um, because they don't have any sort of background in cognitive science or linguistics. So I'm trying to give you a little bit of the background that will help you really understand your interpretations because once you have some of that background, it's gonna be easier for you to think of the next model to build. So yeah, I can build a topics model without understanding anything about cognition, but it's gonna be a lot easier if you've had a little bit of work in semantics to think about how you might um, use those models to do various tasks for your business. So I do think having just a little bit of, of, of psychology research <laughs> will help um, make you a better analyst rather than just also teaching you code. Okay, so we're gonna do a little bit of both, a little bit of theory, a little bit of code, and come up with some cool ways to interpret uh, language research. So on that note, you should head on over to Canvas and check out what's due for the week.